shares full. Um, so you're probably familiar with Etsy if you're here. And if not, you should talk to me or anyone else wearing one of these orange tags. We'll be happy to talk to you about what we're doing here, including the fact that we're hiring many designers, product managers, engineers, thinkers. <laughs> um, and you're here because Frank is talking tonight as part of our speaker series. Um, so we've been doing the Etsy speaker series for about a year. Um, and we bring people here because we like them, because we want to hear their ideas, they inspire us, or we think that uh, they have some things to share you know, with us as Etsy, as designers, as you know, developers, um, or with the community um, in general. So just last night we had Michael Lopp, he was a former um, engineering sort of product and project manager at Apple. Uh, he's also the guy behind Rants and Repose popular blog. Uh, just a couple weeks ago we had Douglas Crockford. He was the inventor of JSON. Um, so it really runs the gamut and we're looking to expand things even more. So uh, by signing up for this event through Eventbrite, you totally opted yourself in to receive some awesome newsletters from us about future events, which you can easily unsubscribe with one click. But um, that'll keep you updated about soon. Oh, well. <laughs> You're going to get a lot of emails later. from me. Um, so this room you are in is the Etsy Labs, and every Monday night we have open craft night here. Um, so people bring you know, their projects that they're working on, or we'll uh, have sort of scheduled uh, programming um, to really bring people together in the spirit of making things, right? So we'll have people come in with specific projects, tips. We, uh, we often supply the materials. Um, and we don't do this just here, but Etsy teams uh, around the world do this as well. But every Monday night here in this space, was it from 5 to 8 p.m.? Um, please come by. It should be awesome. And you can find out about that and many other things at etsy.com slash community. But uh, we are all here to hear um, Frank Chimero. So after the, after the talk tonight, um, Frank will do a Q&A for a little bit, assuming there's time. We'll grill him with some hard questions. Um, but Frank is a designer, an illustrator, educator. Sure. OK. <laughs> Something else under the guise of educator? Yeah, yeah okay. that's not really up to me. OK. That's up to the students. They learn anything. Um, and you live in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and you teach at Portland State University. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I bought this print from Frank maybe three or four years ago. Um, I thought it was particularly awesome. I grew up in Florida. And I was like, oh, you know what I want to do? I, I bought this and was really pumped. Uh, it was like eight inches square or something. I was like, oh, I got to go buy a like, custom mat for this thing to fit in this frame. And I, was like, I always like small multiples, right? So I'm like, I'm going to get this one. And then I'm going to buy three more prints, like, all, like the four states I've lived in. They're going to be like <laughs> matted similarly. They're going to be in matching frames. So I bought the frames, bought the mats, came home to buy the three other prints. And Frank hadn't done the illustrations of those three states. <laughs> I still haven't, man. <laughs> you, you have not. I still haven't. <laughs> and I think you've denied that request twice, actually. Yeah. Um, it's in my inbox. I'll get but, to it. Uh, I love the work that Frank's done. Um, but even more than that, you know, he's, he's obviously a painfully talented designer, um, if you're familiar with his work at all. But the thing that was most exciting to me about Frank when I first sort of I don't know, ran across his work uh, online, um, was that he's extremely good at articulating ideas about design. Um, and the way that he does that is sort of more poignant, more relevant, and, and more entertaining than most of the designers that I've looked up to for a long time who are two or three times his age. Um, in my mind, Frank is kind of a force uh, in the world of design today. Whoa. You have to live up to that. Um, and interestingly, he's working on a book called The Shape of Design, um, which you raised the money for on Kickstarter, right? Rather successfully. Uh, yeah. Three or four times what you needed. Yeah? Yeah, it went pretty well. It was a good day. People are, people are voting with their dollars for the uh, ideas of Frank Chimero. So I'm really excited to have him here. Um, I'm sure you are too. So please join me in welcoming uh, Frank Chimero. Oh, we've got a blank slide. 
So, um, hey everybody, um, thanks for coming out. It's like 7.30 on a Friday night, so like I can think of like a million different things to do in New York. Um, so thanks for coming out and uh, spending a bit of time with me to do this. How many people in here uh, make things? Okay, every, kind of, kind of? I want, I want. You want to, okay, cool. Um, that's good enough. That's good enough for tonight's talk. Um, this is a new talk. I've never given it before. Um, it's kind of wet paint. It's some ideas that I've had that I've been meaning to put in several other talks that I've not put in because they don't fit quite well. It's a few ideas that I'm putting in the book that I'm currently writing. And um, I'm testing it on you guys. So we'll see how this goes. I'm actually really excited about it. Um, I'm not going to show any of my work. I'm not typically whenever I get up and do these sorts of things, I'm not really interested in talking about my work because there's, I don't know, you can go look at that yourself. What I'm always interested in, if we're going to get like a group of people together on a Friday night to like sit in chairs and drink beer or wine and eat carrots, then <laughs> they're orange. It's Etsy. Um, <laughs> If we're going to get all these people together, like the, the value of that is, is to sort of like have a dialogue, and maybe not necessarily to talk about my work, but to, to talk about our work. And because Etsy is Etsy, um, usually I show up and do these things, and I'm pretty sure that most of the people I'm talking to are designers. But I didn't really want to make that assumption this time around. I just wanted to sort of make the assumption that I'm only talking to people that, that they just make things, you know, and, and that's, that's a big part of who they are, or they want to make things. Usually when I give these talks, um, I, I see that. Um, <laughs> I'm going to pull out some, some wicked tricks here uh, inside of Keynote. Um, usually when I show up and give these talks, I usually have like points that I want to make. Like, like, here's a thought. What do you think about that? Here's a thing. And I sort of bait you along. But tonight, it's, it's not really even that. Like, I just wanted to kind of get together with a big group of people and sort of celebrate the fact that we make things and how great that is. Um, so maybe there might be some takeaways, but I just wanted to like celebrate in and of itself how great it is the fact that we make things. And we, we all do it. And, and the reason that we do it is we make things because we have the itch. This is what I call it. I call it the itch. It's, it's like that itch that never goes away that you can never quite fully reach. But like when you sit down to make something, it's like the one time that it becomes bearable. Like if you go, if I go too long, I don't want to speak for anybody else. If I go too long without making anything, whatever it is, I just get really awful to be around. You know, like like how people get when they don't sleep, or like how babies get when they don't eat something when they're hungry. This is how I get when I don't make things, and um, a lot of my friends are like this as well. And it's it. it seems like there's like a specific group of people that have this itch to make things. And um, I, I think it's really buried pretty deep inside of us. Um, I'm not the kind of person that would want to like split the whole world into two groups of people. But if I were to split the whole world into two groups of people, like it wouldn't, it wouldn't be like, it wouldn't be liberal and conservative. It wouldn't be men and women. It wouldn't be like city mouse, country mouse. It would be people who have this compulsion to make things and people who do not. Because like this is the divide. Like I am so ingrained in this act of making and it's so important to me. Like I can't even begin to understand somebody who does not have that need. And I think most of us have that need. Um, because the itch is like, it's like really, really buried deep down in us. If I get some feedback, can you tell me what to do to make it go away? I'll just keep going. OK, cool. So I think that um, this, this compulsion to make things, whatever that might be, when I say make things, I mean that very generally. So for me, it's usually like it's designed for my clients, it's illustrations, it's writing, um, it's any number of things. But like, when I say making, it could be like a process. Like it could be like dance, or it could be, um, I don't know, it could be knitting. It could be anything in the world where you sit down and you do something, and after you do that thing, the world is different in some way, or you're different in some way. That's what making is. And when that happens, and when you do that, and when that's a key part of you, you start to, you start to realize something. Um, there's, there's a blog by. Um, a writer and illustrator. She does a lot of kids' books. Her name's Myra Kalman. And um, 
She used to do this blog for the New York Times, and it was called In Pursuit of Happiness. And it was, it was sort of dialoguing a lot of the things about the Founding Fathers and events in Washington, D.C. and all of that. And all the blog posts are just brilliant combinations of images and words. But there was one specific one that I just like really held on to. She finished it about a year and a half ago. But there was one aside in one specific post where she said, everything is invented. And I really love that. As a person like, that has the strong compulsion to make things, just to finally read everything is invented made me feel really great. Because she, she went on. When you think of inventions, you think of like light bulbs and, and radios and things like that. But the examples that she gave were actually quite a bit different. So language, childhood, careers, relationships, religion, philosophy. These are things that we invent. Um, and that's, that's really profound to me. As a person who considers making something such a core part of who I am, all of the things that I think are the best about humankind in this list, they're inventions of people. And then she went even further out. Um, she said, uh, the future. The future is an invention as well. And um, this is something that I'm more strongly believing. It's, it's that um, we're more at the whims of other people than we think because we're such in a, in a tight knit community of people, whether we realize it or not. But also we have like this, this unfathomable control about choosing our own path and sort of walking it and defining what the future is and actually making that future. So, I mean, I voted for him, but the Obama thing right now is to sort of go around the country and say that we need to win the future. And I actually don't think he's right at all. Like, you don't win the future, you make it. And if everything's invented, including the future, that means that I really think that the future belongs to people who make things. It's an active voice. The best way to celebrate things is to make things. The best way to complain about things is to make things. Everything's invented. And because everything's invented, um, that, that manifests itself in a trillion different ways. Everything is everything. So if everything is invented, that means skyscrapers, means the steam engine, means pencils, it, it means music. Uh, even baseball, uh, the printing press, uh, Cookie Monster was invented, uh, jazz music, novels, the Snuggie was invented, uh, the Mona Lisa, and uh, you know, of course, the cornballer. <laughs> Right? So like all of this stuff is, is, is invented, like every single thing. And like this is like an invention inside of an invention. It's like a fake invention inside of a television show that is an invention. And you can just like go, like go so far down deep inside of this. And it's just incredible to sort of like look at everything. And every single thing in this room is just sort of like people all the way down. So we're all in here. I'm giving a talk. I invented this talk. You're listening to it. Hopefully you'll go invent something after you leave here. You're sitting in a chair. A chair was made by somebody, or it was made by a machine that was made by somebody. It's just like this really tight-knit network of people. And it's like we think that we're not very related. But all of these inventions are just sort of people all the way down. So if everything's an invention, um, it means that everything's there, except what it hasn't been invented yet. But it also means that simultaneously before that, there's another cool keynote trick. Before that, there was a time when there was nothing that was invented. And, and I've been thinking about this quite a bit as I sit down and it's like, if making is so important to who I am, like what, what happened with people before they were making things? So before there was anything, there was nothing, right? Just like darkness, the void, whatever you want to call it. And there's like a million different stories about how you go from nothing to something. But something happened. And you know, most people sort of say that it's like this big bang. And you can think that it's that. But there's like a little part of me that doesn't want to believe in it. There's a little part of me that doesn't want to believe that like the creation of everything ever was not like this big momentous occasion. Part of me wants to believe that it was very subtle and very nuanced. It wasn't a big bang. There's no fireworks. There's no pyrotechnics. It was just sort of like a, like a, like a softly approaching light happening. 
I don't want to believe in a Big Bang because I want to believe in the idea that this is not violent. It's a soft thing to go from nothing to something. And then you got the first thing. Whatever that first thing was, whatever that first little particle thing that happened in the nothingness, then you have a thing. And I'm not smart enough to really understand like, the logistics of all of this. I just know that on one end you have nothing, and then magic happens, and then you have something, whatever that may be. And this is like, really interesting to me, because it's sort of like, if you go from nothing to something, what happens with people? You go from nothing to something, and then all this, you, know, you crawl out of the primordial ooze, and then we get arms and legs and hands and brains and hearts. And then something happens where we start making things. So like, what was, like, the, what was like, the first time that people started using their hands? Like, if I feel like making is like, such a strong part of who I am, who is the first person to make something? There has to be a first one, right? There's a first thing for everything. So this is, um, this is a Greek philosopher, you know, lived thousands of years ago, but he said it's by having hands that man is the most intelligent of animals. That's Anaxagoras. And, um, Part of me really wants to believe in that, and, and another part of me wants to say that it's not just that we have hands, it's that we use them. And I think that that's sort of like the, the magic spot of what it means for us to be human. So when you go back and you like start researching this stuff, like what is the first thing that we made? You know, like, Bethy is about craft and independent making. Like what, what was the first thing that we made? And this is it. Um, this, is, this is a hand axe. It's from Kenya. And um, it's kind of crazy. I mean, it's just a rock that's being chipped away by another rock to turn into something useful. Um, it's from 120,000 BCE. So do the math. I'm bad at math. I draw pictures. I haven't done math in years. So like this, this rock is the first human-made thing that we have a record of. And it's actually really incredible because this is a drawing of it, but I look at it and I, I own one of these things. It's called a hand axe. What a hand axe is, is it's, it's the first tool made by humans. And, and what you do with a hand axe is you sort of hold this rounded tip in your hand. It's probably about the size of a deck of cards. You hold it in your hand and you use it to scrape meat off of the bone, to crack open nuts. Basically, this is a tool to feed yourself. And I'm thinking about this. This is like such a huge step, and it's essentially like the same thing that I go through every single time I sit down to make something. And, and what that process is, is first, it's, it's an assumption that we make. And the assumption is that the world can change. It's malleable. The world's not quite yet done. And to understand that the world is malleable, this first time that whoever this is, woman, man, whatever, did this in the savannah of Africa, just shot off everything that we have now. So I picture this man or this woman sitting underneath this acacia tree in the savannah of Africa 120,000 years ago, and sitting in the shade, and that light slowly approaching him or her. I see that light slowly approaching the one that made nothing turn into something, slowly creeping up and kissing the face of whoever made that first tool. And I think of her stepping out of the shade of the acacia tree to go find another rock, to bang away at this first rock with. And it's kind of like a really nice analogy for how people have influence on one another. You know, like one rock chisels away at another rock to make a more ideal situation, to, to make something useful. And it's just such a great image. And then I look at that acacia tree, and I think about what's, what must be going on in the mind of that person who chipped away at that rock. And I look at diagrams of neurons inside of the human brain, sort of like where ideas happen, the negative space inside of there. And I can't help but see these similarities between what is happening in the environment externally and what is happening in the environment internally. It's like this light kisses the face of that person and then that creates like this electric storm inside of their brain to understand like the world isn't done yet. It's still not done. If you go back to that blog post by Myra Kalman, what she says is these inventions, they don't exist in some natural state. 
They're not there for the plucking. The world's not yet done because we haven't changed it. And this is all about making things, and it's about instituting change to sort of make things better. And I think whenever we sit down to make things, we want to make things better, whether that's us or the world or whatever it is. Like that's, otherwise, we don't have any motive to sit down and make things. It could be as profound as making this thing will improve the lives of thousands of people. Or it could just be like, I feel like shit. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to paint to make that feeling go away. So there's the hand axe. And you know, if you walk into sort of any, any kind of curiosity shop, you can pick one of these up for about 60 to 80 bucks. It's a lot to spend for a rock. But I mean, it's such a beautiful symbol to me. So I've got one, and I like pick it up, and I hold it in my hand. And it's just so nice because like the tip is still sharp after all of these years. And it's so smooth. And typically, like the, the surface of it, the coloring of it is so even that you pick it up and you think to yourself, like, this person cared about this thing. And there's details inside of that rock that do not make it more useful. Like, that tool is not more useful if it's symmetrical. That tool is not more useful if it's evenly chipped away. It just needs to be sharp. And when you look at the oldest one that we have on record, which is what that drawing is of, there's details in it that have no purpose for being there, from like how useful that tool is. And I used to think that tools were the thing that made us human. Like that's like what makes human beings so incredible from any other sort of primate. But when you do a bit of research, you understand that there's some monkeys on the savanna that use rocks to open nuts still. But they just grab any old rock that they can grab, and they crack open the, the nuts. So what makes us human isn't really necessarily the fact that we have these tools. I would say that it's something else. It's the idea of craft. Um, it wasn't the fact that we had a tool. It was the fact that we made a tool better than it needed to be for some external reason. Like this concept of beauty. Like it was just, we wanted it to be good, even from the first go round. And that's really special to me. Like that, that, that is buried as deep inside of us as the compulsion to make things. It's like you have one little gene that says you must make things, and then right next to it, there's like a little disclaimer that says these must be good things. You know what I mean? Like nobody wants to make bad work. Everybody wants to like have high craft and do work that they're proud of. And I have a saying that, that I tell my students, and I say that craft is love manifest. Um, because craft and love kind of, they operate on the same stuff. Like they operate on care and attention and time. You know what I mean? It, something's not going to be well crafted if you don't love what you're doing and love what you're working on. So it's like these two things sort of run, they're similar machines, but they run on the same fuel. And every single time that it seems like the work of my students doesn't have an elevated enough craft, it's either because they don't care enough or because they're not putting enough time in it. But really, I think craft is profoundly human. And because it is love, we sort of understand it. You can tell a love story that's thousands of years old, and we still kind of get it. And because of that, craft sort of folds time in on itself. Like you can find things that are incredibly old that are still brilliant to me. So I can look at this painting by Van Eyck from the 1400s, and I can just like marvel at the brushwork inside of this. You know, like there's symbols in here that I may not completely understand, but I can look at this painting, and you know, it's like however many times older than me, and I can still look at it, and I can still marvel at it. You can still take a lap around the mat and see so many beautiful, well-crafted things, and feel like whatever's going on inside of this is like right next to you because that craft is folding the time. You know, I can look at uh, Gutenberg's original 42-line Bible, and I can marvel at the typography, or I can just say these ornamentations are just absolutely gorgeous. It's just well-crafted. It's just, it's just beauty personified. I think it can fold time, but I think it can also sort of bridge cultures as well. So like this ornamentation and this patterning inside of a mosque, I don't know much about that. But I know that this is beautiful, and this is impressive. And if you look at this and you say, nah, that person didn't really give a shit, you're wrong. You know, like you look at this and you say, like, this person cares so much 
about what they're doing that it's so complicated it makes me dizzy. It's so complicated I, I, like, I can barely even understand it. And there's a beauty to that. And you can go way back. So like Stonehenge has a certain beauty to it as well. And I have no idea what this is about. It's a pile of rocks, but I still look at it and I observe this beauty. And I know it does something with the sun and I know that something good happens once a year, but I don't know any of that stuff. You know, like I would still want to go and I would still want to see it. And I'm sure when I was there, when you're in the orb, when you're close to high craft, like there's this magical aura around it. And it's just impressive. And I'm obviously showing like very famous work, but I think that this can happen with any kind of work whatsoever. You go out to eat at a restaurant, the presentation of that dish is immaculate, right? And it tastes incredible. Like that's, that's craft. And we love that because every single time I think that we're presented with craft, it's partially, yes, this person is very talented. He or she has this thing that is very difficult to get. There's something special there, there's a spark. But the other thing is that you get it and you look at it and you're immersed in it. And the other core idea is that like, whoever did this really cared. And I think that craft and making things sort of turns into the cycle of caring. I'm allowed to gain access to the things that other people make where they care intensely about those things. And then I feel compelled to go away and to make things that I care about and hopefully find a way to sort of close the loop of that caring. So we get to sort of push it on. And because it bridges time and because it has the capacity to bridge cultures, I think, I think one of the things that it does is it puts us inside of this human tradition. If there's like two groups of people, people who feel really strongly compelled to make and another group of people that maybe feel otherwise, it means that maybe there was always this group of people that felt really strongly compelled to make things. You know what I mean? Like maybe even like 1000 BCE, there was like this group of people that had this inert need that they just had to make things. And that's really, really special to me because what it means is that every single time that we make something, it becomes a sequence of responses to life. We always kind of make something in response to the things that we care about. And the things that we care about are these little elements that are inside of our lives. And when you make something, you're sort of placing yourself inside of that sequence. And it can't really be exhausted. You know, it's like, how many love songs do we need? How many scary movies do we need? How many, how many books do we need about someone dying? So there are these mile markers. There's these touchstones that we all sort of go through. And, and I feel like sort of the best stuff that we do are responses to those prompts and responses to just sort of like the typical problems that we have. So everybody's familiar the, with the fact that there's like a trillion different kinds of chairs out there, right? And like the core problem hasn't changed and we're never gonna make a chair and say this is the ultimate chair, we no longer need to make any more chairs other than this design ever. But when you line up all of these different kinds of chairs, it just becomes so interesting to sort of consider these things as a series of responses to sort of like the same problem or the same need. And I think everything that we make sort of fills a need. If we make art, it's filling our emotional need. And if we do a really good job, it fills an emotional need inside of somebody else. Um, if you're a designer like me, you're trying to address a very specific need that may be your own or it may be your client. But we're sort of like making these responses to needs and they all sort of like fill in this spectrum of different responses to ultimately what boils down to very similar prompts over and over and over. And those prompts, I think, are very squarely one of the things that just makes us human. Like there are these irreconcilable things that are inside of us that will never go away. And so we make things and we tell stories and we do all of these things to sort of help us better cope with these things if they're bad or make us better understand these things or celebrate these things if they're good. Um, we may have evolved, we may be much different people now than we were thousands of years ago, but I think ultimately we still sort of care about the same things. So this is another like really old rock sculpture and I'm sure you can tell what it is. Um, they've tried dating it and it's from between four and 10,000 BCE. So this is obviously like a very small rock sculpture of a couple embracing and you know, like maybe just having sex. And then you can compare that with 
another response. So this is a sculpture by uh, Brancusi, who's, who was an Italian sculptor at the beginning of the 20th century. And certain things don't change very much, you know? The way that we think about making things might change, but ultimately I think like the role and purpose of making those things doesn't necessarily change. As a maker, I feel like the reason that I make things is to get better. And there's kind of two different ways that you can look at this phrase of getting better. Like the first one is sort of, I want to be better at what I do. I want to be better in my craft. I want to be a better designer. I want to be, I want to be a better draftsman. I want to be a better writer. So I write so I can become a better writer. So that's one mode of getting better. We need to practice. We do this so that our work can become better. But I think that there's like a second level of that. We sort of do this to feel like so we can become better. I know the times that I sit down and I write or the times that I sit down and draw, a lot of times it sort of feels like there's like this thorn in my side that I need to pry out, you know? And the only way that I know how to get rid of that thorn in my side is just to pry it out by making something. Like that's the only positive activity that I know to make a negative feeling go away is making something. So there's sort of like two parts to that. It's like getting better to become a better craftsperson, but it's also getting better like in an emotional state to get better, get over, and more importantly, um, to get happy. This is why we do this, right? I mean, we can tell a million different lies about why we make things. But ultimately, we started making things because it made us happy. And we keep making things because it continues to make us happy in some way. And the moment it stops making us happy is when we stop. But we make things to make ourselves happy. And I think that making is sort of like an overflow of the heart in that sort of way. It's either you are happy, so you go do this. And other times, you want to be, so you go do this. Um, when you think back at like the very first things that we make, you can look at that stone tool that I put up, the hand axe. Another thing that you might think of is like the cave paintings in France, right? And one of the things that they apparently believed was they were participating in some sort of magic when they were making those cave paintings. And you know, obviously we sort of look around and say, okay, magic's not real. But the process of making like and those people believing that they were participating in some sort of magic. I don't know how far off they were. I think, I think they might have been onto something. So I'm, I'm gonna wrap up with this thought. Um, this is obviously some cave paintings. It's, it's not the cave in France. It's, it's, um, it's in Santa Cruz, Argentina. Um, it's still really old though. It's still about 9,000 years old. And um, it's called the Cave of Hands uh, for a very obvious reason. Because you see this as you initially walk into it. You see animals, you see their surroundings. But as you go deeper into it, you start to see other things. Um, you see hands. And this is, this is not something that happened all at once. This is definitely more like graffiti than a painting. So this has happened over years and years and years of time. But over these years of time, everybody has left their mark. They've made something, they found this wall, and they leave their hand there as to say, I was here. And I put this in earlier today, and I thought about what it's like to come and speak in front of people and like what it means to come and speak at Etsy, which is a website that's just sort of a, well, it is. It's a community of makers. And you can't really help but look at that image and, and think that everybody that participated in that is some sort of community of makers that bridges over time. And that's how I feel. So because we all make things, I'm connected to you and you're connected to me. And somehow, we're connected to everybody else who has ever done this. And I think that that's a really wonderful thing. And um, I think that we're connected because we all have that same little spark. The thing that kissed the face of that woman that was sitting underneath that acacia tree that compelled her to think that the world isn't done and she needs to make something. So I wanted to, to end with um, my favorite haiku. Um, so it's lighting one candle with another spring evening. So um, I, I want to wish you a happy Friday, happy spring evening, and um, 
hopefully I've been able to do that for you. And by coming here, you've done that for me. So thank you. Were we going to do some Q&A? Yeah. OK, cool. How much time do we have? As much as we want? OK. We own this building. We're Etsy. Hello. All right, we're on. It's on. Um, so I had a professor, and take this with a grain of salt then. Sure. But he would look at work. And he would say, this is well crafted, right. but the idea is crap. Right. And it doesn't matter how much crap, how much time you put into the craft if the idea doesn't matter. How do you equate the time you put into the idea versus the craft that you, you end up making? I think that when you make something for yourself, it doesn't matter. When you're participating in some sort of mode of commerce um, or where you're intending to have an audience, um, then you have one obligation. And the obligation is, does the thing that you make help us to live better? And you're asking about concept and all of that. And I think that that's like two steps removed. So it's like, you want a good concept so it can be, um, so it can work for whoever you're making it for, right? And you want it to work for whoever you're making for so that it can be beneficial to their business or whomever that client is. And you want it to be beneficial for their business so it turns into something that helps them to live better and thusly you to live better. And hopefully whoever the audience for that thing is as well. Um, so craft on its own is not enough. I think content matters. I think ideas matter. Um, I think that that's a big part of my work. but. Uh, the things that I was talking about was mostly like the internal part of making, like what happens when you're, the door is closed, it's locked, it's 3 a.m., and you're like toiling away, you know? And obviously very different things need to happen when you take this thing and reveal it to the world because there's a much different criteria that happens when you take the easel and you turn it away from yourself and face it out towards the world. So the idea of like concept and, and utility and all of that I think is really important if you're intending on sharing that work with other people or if you're producing something that has utility to it. Like those chairs that I showed earlier, um, part of the craft of that is actually making a comfortable chair, I would say. And nobody would care about the chairs that I put up there, like the shaker chair, the Ames bent plywood chair, and I think the last one was like the Frank Gehry cardboard chair. Um, Nobody would care about those things if they were lousy chairs. You know what I mean? So like th this, you're right. You're right in saying that this is a very symbiotic relationship between craft and concept or utility or ultimately purpose that sort of comes together into whatever a successful, successfully made thing is. Right? So those two things certainly do work together, I think. I was just maybe focusing more on one than the other. So thanks for the question. Also, if you guys can't hear the questions through the mic, I'll just repeat them. So just let me know. OK? Everybody wants to eat carrots. <laughs> yeah? All right, I'll go ahead. Um, yeah, sure. I was, something you wrote, you wrote something recently about um, you're proud of your work, but you felt that it, it's been mostly clever rather than intelligent. Right. I guess I just want to hear your thoughts on that and maybe your thoughts about just kind of in general the work that you see a lot of people doing. And I mean, I, I feel similarly dissatisfied if I do too much clever work. OK. So let's, did everybody hear that? OK. This is a nice room. Things tend to carry. Good. So um, a couple of weeks ago, I was just writing about working. And um, one of the things, the work that I typically do is like editorial illustrations for magazines. And um, my job in those is to be clever. Like I'm a summarizer. My job is to be catchy and pithy. 
You know, like that's what I'm getting hired to do. It's like I'm supposed to summarize this article that maybe you know hundreds or thousands of words in a nice, concise visual image. That's what I get hired to do. And um, the comment that I made was I was looking through the work and I sort of had the gut feeling that the work that I produced was maybe clever, but it wasn't necessarily intelligent. And um, just to sort of parse those words, I think that um, things can be clever and intelligent at the same time. But I do not feel like clever is necessarily indicative of intelligence. So I was looking through the work, and I felt like I did my job. The client was happy, and I was happy with the work at the time, um, because the work was clever, and it did do a good job of sort of summarizing the article that was there. The problem with it was, and this might have been, should have been something that I put inside of here, I think one of the other reasons that we make things is because we have, we want to produce some sort of legacy about what we make. It doesn't mean that we need to like have our paintings in art history books or something. We just want to like make something that feels like it's important to somebody else. And like, you know, like when you're on your deathbed and you look back at everything that you made, it doesn't matter if anybody else likes it, but you want to feel good about what you made. And that's sort of what the legacy thing is about. And I was sort of looking at it and I sort of said I spent so much time trying to be clever and maybe not enough time actually trying to be intelligent with what I was doing. So I, I feel like clever can have value, but it's not intelligent unless it has value. Like, value is something that makes intelligence intelligent. It's like, it's, it's a net gain. Whereas clever can just sort of be like fun and whimsical. It's like, intelligence can be like that too, but like it moves us forward in some sort of meaningful way. What was the second part of the question? Was there a second part? I, no, I just... Okay. Yeah, I mean, it was just, I mean, this might be definitely a situation where I have very specific definitions for words and other people might have different definitions for those words. And, you know, if somebody disagrees with me about that, we could just like argue about the definition of words all day. Um, have you ever had friends that do that? It's like the most annoying thing ever. I was like that guy for a little bit, so. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, what's up? Well, kind of hedging on both the uh, first two questions, and admittedly, I have not yet read I have uh, not yet read that post on right. clever versus intelligent, but I'm wondering um, what what are your thoughts on the uh, making or recognizing or not recognizing the intelligence of your audience? For example, maybe this is more of your definition of clever, but doing work that kind of requires other people to have a, you know be predisposed to some sort of thing to understand it, or Basically making, what are your thoughts on making your audience work to understand what you're producing? Or either you personally or just the design community in general? Yeah, I don't know. I think it depends on the situation, right? So like, if I'm doing an article, or an illustration for an article on Business Week, I can't make the reader work too much. You know what I mean? But like if I'm writing a book, I can make them work a bit. Um, I think there's different contexts for how much a person's willing to hustle for you. You know what I mean? Like if, if how much of their attention do you already have? Because the more of your attention you already have, the more willing they'll be able to sort of like do a little bit of that legwork um, to sort of meet you halfway. Um, and, and I feel like, that, like that, that, that's based a lot on formats, you know? So like if you sit down with a book, like that's a meaningful thing. You're probably not gonna sit down with a book and like watch an episode of Full House at the same time, right? But on the other hand, like you might flip through a magazine and, and watch an episode of Twin Peaks at the same time, like that seems like it might happen. Um, so maybe, maybe it's very limiting just to sort of say like this is based on context, but I don't think that it's necessarily based on the intelligence of the reader. I'd rather presume that I'm talking to smart people than presume that I'm talking to dumb people um, because the worst situation in the world seems to be to assume that people are dumb and actually have them be really smart. So just a quick follow-up then, do you think it's worth, um, I mean, I guess this is more about designing for yourself because you can kind of control how much you want oh, people to yeah, work for certainly. you, but do you think it's worth putting people off because they can't understand what you're doing and you just right. have to recognize that maybe the top 20% of intelligent people in the world are the people that you just care about? Do you think it's worth not caring about the other 80% if you're doing work for yourself as far as putting in hidden messages or symbols or funny jokes or inside things or whatever. I don't know if you're getting, you're obviously not getting I, I feel like that you should care about everyone because to exclude someone from caring seems cruel. 
But I feel like that to think that you could make something that appeases everyone is a false belief. Um, what is that Tibor Kalman quote? I'm going to butcher it, but like if, if no one hates it, then no one will love it. Sort of like that. I mean, I'm, I'm more willing to sort of like speak up to people or maybe do something that won't have as wide of an audience to maybe have something that has a little bit more relevance or resonance with a smaller group of people. Loving so, it, loving and it don't necessarily have to be what's that? Loving and it yeah, I mean, I mean, that's 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 a really good point as well. Um, loving and hating it doesn't have to do anything with intelligence of the people, um, but I'd rather assume that people are intelligent and be proven wrong than assume that they're dumb and. I don't know, a lot of awful things come out of that, it seems like. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? I don't want to pause the red, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're going to have like a comment on the same, same conversation. Yeah, is this like a conversation or just questions? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, just, just that thought, I was thinking, and maybe this is something I read on your board as well. Maybe someone can help me out. But Elaine de Bolton talks about idioms and the problem with idioms uh, is that they're true, but they're not the whole truth. They simplify. Right. So like a so like a cliche is a narrow interpretation yeah, cliche, of the right. truth because it sort of misrepresents how beautiful a sunset can really be because it sort of dumbs you down to the profundity of the phrasing by just hearing it so often. Exactly. And so just just a thought I was having as you were talking about cleverness versus intelligence is. A lot of the work you do, although it's clever, it's supporting intelligent content. It may be somewhat, you can say cliche, I don't wanna, I'm not uh, insulting your work, because it, it's great, but uh, something that is easy to get, and it just very, it resonates with everyone. Right. But it, it, it goes with intelligent editorial content. Well, I think you can say very intelligent things with very small, simple words. Yeah. So. And, and uh, cause I've, I've, a frustration I've had, this week I've been, I was working on Uh -huh. um, and kind of we, we started to get to that point where we're doing kind of clever, funny, jokey right. presentations without the intelligence of the content. Right, and sort of the bad thing about that is it sort of strips out the gravitas of the situation right. and sort of turns it into something that's maybe pithy or ironic. And ultimately what that might do is it might undercut um, the actual importance of the event. Like the last thing that you want is to have people be blasé about something that could be really important. So there's something in the back. Yeah. Thanks, Randy. I just want to know about your approach to the work that you do for yourself and okay. then versus the, your approach to work that you do as an assignment. Which right. is more satisfying to you and how how do you approach them in each case? Like, uh, is, it, is it completely different and is it easier to be satisfied with something that's an assignment because you've got a direction? I don't I, know, go, go. I think it goes back and forth, right? Because it's sort of, um, it's a distinction of control. How much control do I have in each situation? With a client, you relinquish control um, with personal work, you have total control. And both of those can be incredibly hard and oppressive in different ways. So the situations that I'm the happiest are the situations where I'm sort of like writing myself or formulating my own content. And then creating design that sort of acts as dictating the tone and communicating those messages in some way. That's where I'm the happiest. But there is a certain pleasure in feeling like you've helped someone. You know, and that's sort of like the joy of of doing client work sometimes for me. It's like you never get the feeling like you get to swoop in and save the day when you're working for yourself. You know? And like that doesn't happen very often. But with client stuff, it's always nice to feel appreciated when you do good work for them. You know, it's nice to have your work feel appreciated in that capacity. In how I approach each one, there's just different sets of limitations. So there's obviously very implicit limitations on the client side. And with the personal work, I typically self-impose limitations on myself so I can actually get to work. 
um, with no limitations, I've got no sort of lattice work to sort of hang my thoughts on or no limitations to sort of work inside of. Um, that's implicit with almost every single client job that I get. And that's sort of the framework and the mode of thinking that I've learned how to be a maker inside of. So when I do personal work, it's usually the first bit of the projects is like trying to replicate those limitations on myself because I've never experienced a situation where I could just run wild and fancy free with whatever I'm doing. Um, I'm very much the sort of person who needs to make something in response to something else. Yeah, I mean, both are certainly communicative endeavors. So like there's one set of restrictions implicit, which is like, what will people understand, right? So like that's one thing. And you know, there's like certain artists that have let go of that in a very interesting way. But being trained as a designer, like I'm not willing to let go of that. Like I love concepts and I feel like being able to communicate in some capacity with somebody is like the benefit of holding a megaphone of making. It's like I can say something. And yeah, there might be value of making it like a Dada poem or saying gobbledygook or something like that. But like if I'm holding a megaphone, like what's the added value of saying something that might resonate in some way? So I'm always trying to say something. Um, it's just sometimes the things that I want to say and it's sometimes the things that other people want to say. And um, if it's work for other people, then there's a whole new set of concerns based on their needs and creating something that has use for them, that works well for them. Whereas for me, I can just let go of all of that. Yeah, does that help? Okay, thanks. Maybe one more question? Um, hey. I realize your talk is sort of uh, a big overview, so it's probably not fair to sort of like nitpick about certain things, but I feel like there are sort of like two topics that have come up that um, were largely uh, lost over, so maybe you could talk about yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Um, one is sort of the notion of like if everything is invented, including language and, and uh, philosophy, then clearly the, the, the notion of aesthetics is also invented. So to right. suggest that, you know, um, the, the idea of craft and, and well made things. Aesthetics is also an evolving thing, and the conversation goes through that. And then the other part of you is um, the notion of audience. So we've been talking about the things right now, but uh, I would suppose, you know, uh, some sort of suggestion of idea or conversation with an audience, but right. all of this also seems to be sort of internal and what motivates people to create things. But clearly, the act of creation is something in a vacuum, and it's done in order to um, not also just help people, but contribute right. to conversations. Right, um, and um, maybe talk about the notion of audience and stuff. those are obviously really important things, right? So like if you make something, you more than likely will intend to share it with an audience, unless it's something like a diary or something like that. But even diaries seem to have audiences now as well. Um, it was a very specific reason that I called the talk the maker's mindset, because that's an internal pursuit and not <coughs> external. And um, audience is definitely a very external thing. I won't reduce the obligations to an audience. I'm a designer, so I think there's the utmost responsibility to an audience, to be fair with them, to be honest with them, to appreciate them, um, to do all of those things. Insofar as aesthetics, I think that it's sort of a self-steering ship. Um, when you look at the things that we consider to be beautiful or to be pleasurable. It's not inevitable. Um, just because different cultures consider different things to be beautiful. Um, and, and certainly it is not absolute uh, because you just have to think about situations from previous points in time where people were presented with work that was different aesthetically that they just freaked out over. Right, so like, think of impressionist paintings. You know, people fl flipping out over impressionist paintings, and now my mom has like a little Monet a day calendar or something like in her office. So, I feel like it's maybe not a self-steering ship, but it is definitely something where 
the adjacency of what is possible inside of the realm of aesthetics, it pushes further out and maybe the comfort zone of that continually gets bigger. Just from people not necessarily like pushing from the inside but more pulling from the outside and then sort of accepting that. Um, what is it? The Rites of Spring, right? So like first performance of the Rites of Spring, people are revolting in the audience. And eventually like modern ears got trained to that way of arranging notes. So audience is of course important. Aesthetics is of course not a universal thing. It's a developing thing that changes. And I didn't address them because the talk's the maker's mindset. But you have a point. I, I agree with you on both those things. I, I lied about one more question. We, we're live streaming. You okay. You don't know. And there's a, there's a question from someone on, on the okay. live stream. Okay. Yeah. It's a, it's a good one. So um, this question is by Echoes of Summer. Who? Echoes of Echoes Summer? Echoes of Summer. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, what, ASL. Do you, what do you do when inspiration is low, when there's no good thorn in your side? Um, you do the same thing that people have always done. You go for a walk, and then you try again. I don't know. There's no magic formula. Inspiration seems like a dirty word. It seems like you're waiting for some sort of external grace. But I don't know. You guys make stuff. You know that it looks a lot like toiling. It looks like you're just being tortured, right? So like, like it's torturous to sit down and make something when you're inspired. And it's also like equally semi-torturous when like you don't know what to make. And it's just sort of like an ebb and flow. It's like you go for a walk, you wait it out. You maybe read a book, you try to forget about it, you take a bath. Um, I don't know, do something. You move. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> do stuff, do stuff, do anything. What's that? Eat some carrots. He's online. She's online. So they can't. I don't want to rub it in their face. They're good carrots. A perfect segue, though. So uh, thank you, Frank, so much. Yeah, for coming. thanks, guys. Thanks for coming tonight to the Etsy speaker series. Um, please stick around for a little bit. We're going to hang out. There's still some drinks and some, you know, some snacks left. And uh, we'll hang out for a